Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at the basic development of the Mauser HSC pistol. This was put into development in 1934, right at the same time that Mauser's Model 1934 pistol actually went into production. Um, the 1934 being the sort of an update of the original Mauser 1910, this was a striker fired basically pocket pistol available in 25 and 32 calibers. And the problem was strikers weren't cool anymore. All the cool kids wanted hammer fired pistols. Uh, so they could have double action and single action and an exposed hammer. And because of this Mauser had lost a significant market share to the Sauer company and in particular to the Walther company with the PP and the PPK. And they didn't have anything to compete with. So they figured we need a we want a hammer fired pistol in production again, a hammer fired pocket pistol. Um, their previous like lead designer, Joseph Nickel, was kind of approaching the end of his career, and they figured we don't want to give it to him. We want we want to have someone new and like some new blood in this process. And so they assigned a very young, he was 25 years old at the time, engineer by the name of Alex Seidel. Now we'll Seidel will go on to uh, be one of the founding partners of H and K, and have a, an extensive career, uh, of which this is only really the very first project. Um, and Seidel's father had worked at Mauser, so he had a good family connection to the company, and he spent about five years developing this pistol. Partly because he was young and not not very experienced with it, but Mauser wanted to be very careful to make sure that they didn't infringe on any patents. They wanted this to be nice clean, easy, you know, make it successful, we don't want it to be a messy project. So they spent some time doing it, and Seidel came up with what is legitimately a really nice gun. So it is a uh, single action or double action gun, it has an exposed hammer, but nicely shrouded, so you don't have a lot of opportunity to get dirt into the workings like you typically would with a hammer. Um, Seidel's trigger mechanism is quite clever and very functional and very practical. Uh, the guns were made in 32 ACP, and initially uh, Walther or Mauser intended these for commercial and police production. The problem was 1938 when the guns finished and, and ready, well the German economy is, is kind of taking up a war footing and they have to get permission to put the gun into production. And to get that permission they have to show that it is a military necessity. Well it wasn't. They didn't intend to sell these to the military. That really, I mean they wouldn't have turned it down, but that wasn't their plan. And frankly, Walther was a lot closer to the Nazi party than Mauser was. Walther had a lot of these contracts for, for the military and for the, the political apparatus pretty well tied up. And this, this put Mauser in a bit of a, a hitch, like, you know, we just put all this work in, why can't we put the gun into production? And it would actually take them until 1940 before they were able to get permission to do it. By 1940 it was realized that, you know, we're going to need more pistols, this war thing that's actually happening now. And so the, uh, the HSC went into production. Now a bit of an aside, HSC uh, stands for, the H is for Han, which is hammer, uh, the S is for Selbspanner, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which basically means self-cocking. Um, so it wasn't just a hammer, it was a double action hammer. Uh, and then C is because this is Mauser's third external hammer pistol. The first one was the C96, the broom handle. Uh, the second one was not really a commercial success, it was Joseph Nichols' 1922 pistols, uh, which would go on to become the CZ27, but that's a story for a separate video. And then this was the third, so ABC, this is the HSC pistol. Now originally this was intended to be a combination of, again, a family of pistols, a large version with a locked breech in 9mm Parabellum, and a small version blowback in 32 or 380 uh, for the, the commercial and police market. Now uh, we can take a look at the locked breech side of that in a separate video. That didn't end up going anywhere, wasn't successful, but the pocket pistol version did, very much like Mauser's first attempt to do a family of this sort with the 1909 and 1910, 1910 guns. We will start this off by taking a look at a, a fairly typical example and do the take it apart and show you how the internals actually go together. So it is a pretty distinctive gun with this sort of webbing at the front of the trigger guard. That is entirely an artistic element and it, it's kind of nice. Um, overall handling of the gun is good, it has a nice deep uh, curve back to the, to the back strap to ensure that you don't get any bite from the slide. The hammer does not extend out at all. You can see uh, when the hammer is forward 
uh, the opening is shrouded to prevent dirt from getting into the gun. When the hammer is cocked, the opening is also shrouded. So that was clever on Seidel's part. We have some pretty basic sights on the top there. Everything else is kind of typical, what you would expect. Safety is back here, uh, down is fire, up is safe. Now to disassemble it, we have a little button here in the front of the trigger guard. And what we're going to do is cock the hammer, remove the magazine, which has a heel release, engage the safety, then I can pop this button down, pull the slide just slightly forward, and it lifts right off the frame. So very easy to disassemble. If you want to take the barrel out, you can actually do that using the, uh, the nose of the magazine floor plate, but we don't need to do that. It's just a barrel with a spring in there. The safety is rather clever in that it's not just a hammer block, it actually pivots the firing pin up and down. So uh, this is the fire position where the firing pin is now in line with the hammer. When you rotate that lever, it pivots the firing pin up in the slide to the point that the hammer simply can't hit it. So that does a really effective job of, uh, of preventing any sort of accidental discharge, and that also locks the slide in place. Looking at the trigger mechanism, probably the most interesting single element to it, um, the, the most creative element from Seidel, is this lever on the top. And that does several separate things. So first off, uh, this has a magazine safety, you can't fire it without the magazine in place. That is the front hook of that bar. So when I try to pull the trigger forward, that hook catches it and prevents it from firing. Once I have the magazine in place, you'll see that this little lip right here is pushed up by the edge of the magazine feed lip. So that lifts the lever up out of the way of the trigger. So now at this point when I pull the trigger, the hammer here can drop. And then we have uh, the slide stop is actually built into the back of the magazine, so that uh, when, when the magazine's empty the slide will hit the back of the follower here, and that'll hold it open. And then you can see that there is a little tab here at the back of this lever. The HSC continues the same method of operation that the earlier Mauser pocket pistols had, where once the thing locks open there is no slide release, you actually have to insert a new magazine in order to drop the slide. And that is basically the same little tab here that acts as a magazine safety. Uh, once, So the slide will lock open on the follower. Once you start to pull the magazine out, this lever, this little tab at the back, lifts up and that holds the slide in place, locked open, until you reinsert a new magazine, at which point this lever is pushed up here, which pivots it down there, which releases the slide. Now if you insert um, a, an unloaded magazine, by the time, one, once you release the first magazine, that allows the slide far enough forward that it will not re-lock on the empty follower. So if you take out an empty magazine and replace a new magazine, it will drop the slide closed on an empty chamber. Up here we can see the locking mechanism um, is just this little plug that prevents the slide from going forward when it's in the upward position. So when you pull it down for disassembly, that's what allows the slide to move forward. While we have this disassembled, I want to take a moment and talk about serial numbers. Uh, the serial number range for these started at 700,001, and it would run to about 970,000. We'll touch on that in a moment. Um, but the serial number is marked in three places. It is in full at the bottom of the front strap, so here on the front strap of the pistol. You will then have the last three digits of the serial number stamped on the barrel. You'll also have the last couple digits of the serial number electro-penciled on the underside of the slide here. Um, so this is always electro-penciled, that's standard, where the barrel is stamped. Now we have a couple really cool guns to take a look at as part of this video. One of them is this, which breaks that rule I just told you, because this is marked up on the front of the slide. And its serial number is V1008 with a commercial proof mark. Uh, v is the, the prefix for, for Mauser's test pistols. 
And with the HSC they started at 1001 and they made about 40 total prototypes in a wide variety of configurations. In general this shares all of the basic configuration characteristics with the actual production guns. There are a couple little differences, for example, uh, the grips are a full wraparound wooden grip where production guns would not be, so there's an extra checkered uh, section back here. And then we have a little bit of a change to the hammer profile, you can see the differences there, a little bit of a change to the sights, you can see the sight here is fully round where this one is more of a traditional square dovetail uh, into the slide, and the markings on this prototype are all hand engraved. Uh, as you would expect from a prototype pistol. Now when the guns went into production there was one more little additional change that they made, and that was to move the grip screw a bit down from where it had been on the prototype. However, this change did not last very long at all. In fact they almost immediately decided to move the grip screw right up into the sort of the middle of the grips. But at that point they'd already made the first 1345 frames, so they went ahead and finished the first 1345 guns with this screw configuration, which among collector circles today is known as the low grip screw variation. Uh, really quite rare, and those were about 50-50 split between commercial sales and Kriegsmarine, or German Navy sales. These early guns actually, they, they aren't hand engraved anymore, but they're actually acid etched markings, which is kind of interesting and unusual, and you'll see they went to a standardized marking format there. Um, the early guns, this actually went quite a while, but at the beginning they had this nice matting to the top of the slide. That's something that would be dropped um, as a wartime economization measure, uh, but not quite yet. The early guns also have a lanyard loop uh, milled into the base of the frame right there. Once real production kicks off this is what they do to the grip screw. So it moves from the low grip screw to the standard configuration. Otherwise this has basically all the same features as the, the low one. As the war progresses though there is a need to simplify and economize on the guns in general. So uh, a few little items get simplified, but mostly what we see here is a reduction in just the finish quality. So there's less polishing being done, you can see that very clearly here. So we have an earlier gun, higher polish, if you look at the flat web here it's, it's very nicely done, a nice deep blue where a pretty late production gun, there's less polishing, so you can see a lot of the residual machining marks, and the finish just isn't, uh, isn't nearly as deep or as nice. Um, the bluing was thinner as well, so later guns are more likely to have deeper, uh, more visible wear on high contact areas like the front strap. Uh, you can see here this is 880 some thousand, so we're getting you know, three quarters of the way through production. A few of the other changes that were made, um, the magazine release on the early guns is kind of narrowed uh, or, or sloped at the edges, and they abandon that. Like, you know what, that really just doesn't matter, we'll go with a squared off magazine release. They got rid of the lanyard loops, so you can see that the lanyard's no longer there. And the markings would change to a, a roll stamping that is slightly different in profile, uh, most notably uh, the addition of those three lines in the middle. But this is, these are really all aesthetic changes. There was only one mechanical change that was actually made to the HSC, one substantial one, over the course of its production. Mauser had been very careful to not infringe on any of Walther's patents in the development of this pistol, like I mentioned at the beginning. And if you're familiar with the Walther PP, when you engage the safety with the hammer cocked it automatically decocks it. Wal uh, Mauser didn't do that, because that would have infringed on Walther's patent. What Mauser did do, however, was include a system, a little feature, where if you have the safety engaged when the slide is locked open, when the slide closes it will drop the hammer, um, so that you're back at double action mode automatically with a round chambered. They did this mechanically in a different way than Walther had, and so they clearly figured that they weren't going to be infringing any patents. Well, Walther thought otherwise. Walther filed a lawsuit for patent infringement, in uh, 1942. They eventually won that lawsuit, and in September of 43, Mauser went ahead and removed that feature. So after serial number 860,000, uh, the HSC will not drop the hammer when you close it, even if you engage the safety. 
hammer stays cocked. So they had to get rid of that, that little bit of a feature. Now one of the really interesting things about the HSC is when they went through this bit of economization. So they, you know, we're going to make the finish poorer, we're going to do less polishing, we want to make the gun overall cheaper and quicker to make. This wasn't the only thing that they experimented with, just kind of a simple lowering of, of uh, aesthetic standards. They also decided to try making a stamped sheet metal slide. And that is what we have here. So this was actually produced in 1942, late in 1942, um, and the idea was simply to reduce the machining time required to manufacture the gun. So if you look at the profile at the back of the slide you can see that it has changed substantially, and of course the, uh, the machining characteristics are different, or the fabrication characteristics. These little divots are what pass for slide rails, that's thinner on the inside, and while it's not immediately evident because they did a nice job finishing it, uh, this is a bent sheet metal slide with the breech block and the nose cap uh, fitted in place afterwards. And this is exactly how H and K would produce the HK4 pistols uh, in the 1960s, af long after the war. In 1942 someone decided that this actually really wasn't the, the best thing to go with. Um, we don't have any insight into exactly what transpired at Mauser uh, about this, but they made a couple prototypes like this one. Uh, and then dropped it. And it would only make a reappearance at the very end of the war when the Volks pistol programs came out. And when Walther went to design a Volks pistol, uh, they came back to this idea, uh, figuring that it would be easier to start with this and then adapt a sheet metal frame to it as well. So those experiments would take place at the very end of the war. Um, but the idea came from 1942. So if I take off that experimental stamped slide, it's down here, and here is a standard slide. And you can clearly see the differences. Um, for example right here you can even still see some of the milling marks where they put in a tool, milled out this area, whereas here that area was always open because the slide uh, was just a piece of bent sheet metal up around here, which they then uh, insert and, and affix this firing pin breech block into. You can see a similar sort of change at the front of the slide. Um, of course these little rail bits, instead of being milled in place, are now pressed in from the outside. Right there. But apparently, I, I don't know if this was either not considered enough of a modification at the time, or perhaps it didn't reduce the cost sufficiently to make sense, uh, but they didn't end up using uh, this until the Volks pistol project, and then until H and K. Just for reference sake I will point out that the serial number of this particular gun is pretty conclusively zero. It's in fact zero 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 there on the front of the frame. One last thing before we go, I want to touch on the users of the HSC. These pistols were sold commercially, um, only about 25,000, so about 10% of them were sold on the commercial market, but that is one group. They were also used by the German police, um, and then they were used by both the army and the German navy. Um, the army is the most substantial of those uh, in terms of quantity, and the army guns will be marked with just a standard typical Waffenamp, um, either 135 or 655, depending on the time frame. And I don't have one of those in our little group here. However, I can show you a commercial gun. This early low grip, low screw is a commercial gun. It will have no markings here on the left side of the trigger guard. It instead has a little commercial proof mark on the right side, right there, that'll be an eagle over N. Police guns on the left side of the trigger guard will have an eagle uh, holding not a swastika but an X with either the letter L or the letter F, so this is a police one. There are then a couple of different navy uh, stamp navy marking versions. This is one of them. This is the this is this is navy, but it's not maybe the most desirable. This is an eagle over M and a Roman numeral three, and you kind of need your bifocals to see that. The version that everybody really wants. This isn't the rarest version, but it is probably the most desirable one. Has that same marking, but then it also has a really big Kriegsmarine eagle swastika over M on the front strap. So. That's the one that everyone looks for because it's a nice big marking that's easily visible. Um, it is not, however, the only actual authentic marking uh, used on Navy contract HSCs. 
the HSC would be produced at Mauser right up until the end of the war, uh, which for Mauser was April of 1945. Uh, in total, somewhere between 250 and 260,000 of these pistols were made by the Germans. Now, upon capturing the factory, um, American troops captured it, it then ended up in the French zone of occupation, and the French had Mauser continue to produce HSC pistols, along with uh, a variety of other firearms that they'd been making there at the end of the war, uh, P-38s, Car 98Ks, and such. There was, a, of course, a large stockpile of parts still available from the end of production, because you know, you, you're always building parts and then later assembling guns. So when this was interrupted you know, mid-operation by capture of the factory, there were a lot of parts sitting around. There's, it, it's hard to draw a, a definitive line of what was the last German pistol and what was the first French pistol, because all these guns and parts were in various stages of completion. Um, however, by the time the French production ended, uh, there were at 900, or 271,923 uh, was the last production, call it military World War II period, HSC. Mauser would reintroduce the pistol later, but that is also a subject for another video. We're just looking at the military versions here. So a grand total of about 272,000 of these produced over the course of the war and the immediate post-war period. Um, it was, as I said, a very successful pistol. Um, doesn't quite get the recognition that the Walther does, um, but these would be, they were very popular with the German military, they were popular with the German police, the French liked them after the war, and they were successful enough to be commercially reintroduced after the war. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this little video. Uh, it's very cool to have examples of the, the standard production guns to put side by side with the very first and the very last, in a way, manner of speaking, um, the, the two very coolest versions of the HSC. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.